It's time for Herd Mentality, the weekly episode where you control the discussion today on Locked on Bills. You are Locked on Bills, your daily Buffalo Bills podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Bills Mafia? It's Joe Marino, author of Go Bills and Buffalo's Run. Also the co-host of the Locked On NFL Scouting Podcast, and I am your host of Locked On Bills. want to thank you for making Locked On Bills your first listen every day, and a big welcome and shout out to our everydayers. You know who you are, those of you who never miss a single episode. I appreciate y'all being here very, very much. I'd also like to invite you to subscribe or follow for free on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. As playoffs wind down, the sports stop sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone, every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Well, folks, welcome in the Buffalo Bills veterans report for training camp today. They practice tomorrow, and football is here. Now, we still have one day left to fill prior to all the news and information that's going to be coming out of Buffalo Bills training camp, so we're going to get herd mentality in today. Now, one programming note for the rest of the week, our podcasts are going to come after the practices, so I'm going to listen to the press conferences, I'm going to take in all the practice information that I can, then I'm going to turn around and put that into a podcast for you after practice. And so there won't be a podcast on Wednesday morning or Thursday morning or Friday morning. Those are going to come in the afternoon. Once we get all of that new information, I can digest it and get you that analysis very, very quickly. As a reminder, I'm not going to be there for the first three practices of camp, but I am going to be there all of next week. I'm taking in five practices next week in person, and I cannot wait to give you those firsthand observations next week. So I just wanted to give you an idea of what the schedule is going to look like. And for example, the Bills practice on Sunday next week, I'm going to give you a podcast after that practice on Sunday. So things are going to be regular, but I wouldn't say that you should expect a podcast every single morning because the information is going to be coming so frequently. And I'm just going to be doing podcasts as things become available. And there's enough for me to break down and deliver for you. So Good time to make sure that you're subscribed so that you get the episodes as soon as they are released. Again, no decrease in frequency of anything more podcasts, just maybe not the same schedule just based on how the bills are operating right now at this point in the calendar. All right, so with that out of the way, let's get into herd mentality. And the first few questions are very Josh Allen focused. It's funny, some weeks we get a bunch of Josh Allen questions, some weeks not so much. This is definitely a week where there's plenty to get into as it relates to Josh Allen. Let's start with this one from Ben. Ben says, can you give us an update on Josh Allen's standings and the Bills' all-time record books for major stats and give your thoughts on how many seasons it will take for him to take the lead, if ever? Also, are there any other Bills players that you think have a realistic shot of climbing any Bills' all-time rankings? All right, let's dive into this. This is fun. I always I always think about this stuff. And I remember when I used to play uh, video games and I would play Madden, my goal was to have the all-time leader in franchise history for like all the different statistical marks. Um, and now we have a real-life version of a guy that has a chance to rewrite the record books, and he certainly is rewriting the record books. Let's talk about it. In terms of passing yards, Josh Allen ranks number three in Bill's history with 22,703 passing yards. He is 4,887 yards behind Joe Ferguson for number two, and he's 12,764 yards behind Jim Kelly for number one. And so I think in 2025, Josh Allen will top Joe Ferguson to be number two. Now, look, there's a world where he could pass for 4,900 yards this season and top Joe Ferguson. I'm not going to predict that. Maybe this year, definitely next year. As for him topping Josh Allen for being the Bills' all-time leading passer, I think you're looking at three to four more seasons for that to happen, but it's only a matter of time before it does. 
In terms of passing touchdowns, Josh Allen is number three with 167 passing touchdowns. He's 14 behind Joe Ferguson for second, 70 behind Jim Kelly for number one. He's he's going to pass Joe Ferguson this year, uh, perhaps somewhere around midseason. He'll be able to get his 15th uh, touchdown pass to surpass him. And then 70 behind jo- uh, Jim Kelly, that's probably two seasons worth of passing touchdowns for him to be number one in that category. When it comes to rushing yards among quarterbacks, he's already number one by a healthy amount, 3,611. That's first place. That's double what Tyrod Taylor has at number two. Also, in terms of rushing touchdowns, he's first among quarterbacks with 53. Jack Kemp second with 25. As for other statistical marks that we could see um, Bill's players jump into this year the only one that i could really find is safeties uh, defensive safeties the all-time lead for the buffalo bills is two chris kelsey has two ron mcdowell has two that's it ed oliver is the only active buffalo bill that has one and so if he gets one safety recorded this year he will tie the all-time lead in franchise history so the reality is you know the bills don't have a deep list of tenured players that are climbing the record books for the Buffalo Bills. Like Stefan Diggs was certainly on that type of path. He was kind of top four in all the major categories, but he's no longer around. So you don't really have guys knocking on the door of this stuff. Um, But maybe in a few years, that'll change as we talk about guys like James Cook and Dalton Kincaid, and we'll see what Khalil Shakir is and Keon Coleman, right? There's guys in the pipeline, but they are far from established enough for us to be talking about them climbing the record books for the Buffalo Bills. One other note that I wanted to bring up from researching uh, this question that was sent in from Ben, Josh Allen's career interception, Mark, and of course, interceptions in Josh Allen is a conversation that never seems to go away. Josh Allen's career interception percentage, so percentage of throws that are interceptions, 2.5%. Now, the Bills have six passers in their history that have topped 10,000 passing yards. Josh Allen is comfortably the lowest when it comes to interception percentage. Jim Kelly's interception percentage, 3.7. Joe Ferguson, 4.6. Jack Kemp, 5.9. Ryan Fitzpatrick, 3.7. Drew Bledsoe, 2.8. Josh Allen, number one, 2.5 among Bills quarterbacks that have passed for 10,000 yards or more. The next one today comes from Bill's WZA. And I'm sure everybody saw this last week. It was Jeremy Fowler of ESPN going through and he polls a bunch of different coaches and executives across the NFL uh, asking for their top 10 players at each position. And so he puts out one position group every single week and the quarterbacks, or excuse me, every single day for like a week or so. And the quarterback article came out last week. Josh Allen, I think, was number three amongst the quarterbacks, maybe number two. I can't remember. But the the thing that everybody was talking about coming out of that was a comment made by some executive or coach in the NFL that said this. And, and the question from Bill's WZA is for me to comment on this comment regarding Josh Allen. And so here's the comment that is under question regarding Josh Allen. One of the most Overrated players in the NFL, immense talent, but he makes a lot of mistakes. He's underdeveloped at winning at the line of scrimmage, tends to lock on to targets, more of a thrower than precision passer, and forces throws into traffic. So what do I think about this? Let's first establish that I think Josh Allen is the second best player in the NFL. Not the second best quarterback. He is the second best quarterback, but second best player. I think the world of Josh Allen. But I think what's challenging for some people as it relates to Josh Allen, some, this is a a percent, not like everybody, some people, and obviously this executive that said these words, is if you watch Josh Allen and expect him to play the position a certain way, he's not going to fit in your box. He colors outside the lines. There's nothing rudimentary about the way Josh Allen plays the quarterback position. And candidly, sometimes even for me, that's frustrating. You could probably tell from some of my analysis on Josh Allen in our All-22 Review episodes during the season 
where I really get specific about decisions, how he operated, things like that. Because when you're trained to understand the position to be executed a certain way and you come across a guy like Josh Allen, and like I said, he colors outside the lines, sometimes that can be difficult to reconcile. He doesn't always do the smart, right thing with the football. There's no question about it. And when you watch the All-22 and you understand the play concept and what the coverage is and where the ball's supposed to go, you can find yourself saying, why did you do it that way? But for me, when I watch and study Josh Allen, it's very easy for me to overlook a lot of that when you consider the elite production. Nobody gets first downs like Josh Allen. Nobody gets touchdowns like Josh Allen. So, yeah, it's not always going to be precision textbook quarterback play, but my goodness, the dude makes plays. And the turnover narrative is completely overblown, completely overblown. You have to have a certain level of appetite for risk if you're going to be a dynamic player in the NFL. All the great ones do. But there's people that don't like Josh Allen. There's people that are mad that they didn't evaluate him correctly coming out of college. And the last thing that they have to cling to are the the turnovers, the interceptions. But they don't know how to contextualize any of it because they're trying to fit it into their box. And there's still a lot of there's still a lot of old heads in in the NFL that believe quarterbacks you have to primarily win from the pocket you know three steps get the ball out precision passing if that's what you want go watch Joe Burrow go watch Kirk Cousins those quarterbacks are for you but if you can't be open-minded enough to understand that there's other ways to execute and engineer great level NFL offenses and Josh Allen does that well then you're boxing in your perspective of football and quite frankly you don't have a great pulse on what's happening in the NFL so I think it's a ridiculous comment and I think you've seen enough defense from big media to understand how ridiculous that comments you're seeing a lot of pushback from people that are like are are we seriously having this conversation and that's how you know it's ridiculous there's my thoughts on that All right, folks, more Josh Allen conversation coming up on the other side of it, including a very specific comparison to him and Patrick Mahomes. Plus, do the Bills have enough elite talent to truly be a contender? All that on the other side, so be sure to stick with me. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help you find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn isn't just another job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for new jobs but might be open to the perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't even visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. And keep in mind, 2.5 million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring. So hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NFL. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NFL to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. All right. Julius has a loaded question for us, and it kind of walks us through a comparison of Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen. Again, the best player in the NFL and the second best player in the NFL through my eyes. And so let's go on this journey with Julius here. Julius says, my questions are these. And I'm going to answer these questions as they're asked. There's like three different questions here. He says, I know it's impossible to predict, but based on data you've seen about Josh Allen and Patrick Mahomes, along with data for Buffalo and Kansas City, I want to know your thoughts. Obviously, Mahomes is unbelievable and the best quarterback in the league, but if these two players played on opposing sides, in particular if Josh Allen was drafted by Kansas City, do you think Josh Allen would have multiple Super Bowl rings? My answer there is yes. And what's difficult about this conversation is reconciling how much Patrick Mahomes 
is awesome, right? He's an elite football player, the best in the league. You're not going to catch me casting any shade on Patrick Mahomes. So don't get any of this twisted. But that dude benefits a ton from primarily the defense. Steve Spagnolo, the way that he orchestrates that defense, the way that it shows up in the playoffs, that's unlike anything what Josh Allen has. My biggest gripe about the Josh Allen tenure in Buffalo is about how his defense has supported him or lack thereof supported him in these playoff games against the Chiefs and the Bengals. To me, that's the leading cause as to why the trophy case remains empty at one Bills drive. So, number one, Mahomes gets defensive support in the playoffs. Number two, he's, he's got Andy Reid. And I think that Sean McDermott's a good head coach. I had this conversation, was it last week? I think he's a top 10 NFL head coach. I have him at number seven. That's not a hot take. That's where most people kind of have him. But Andy Reid at number one. Like it, you cannot, you cannot overstate what that difference is, right? Like who he is as a coach, him being offensive minded, being his, like historically elite, like in the conversation for the best coach in the history of the game versus one of the better coaches right now. That's, that's a big deal, especially for a quarterback getting Andy Reed, not to mention everything that surrounds him in Kansas city. I'm not taking anything away from Patrick Mahomes. But I think if jo if Patrick Mahomes has won three of the last five Super Bowls, I think Josh Allen could have won at least two with Kansas City with that defense with Andy Reid. The next question is, how much has Mahomes benefited from what I see as having a future Hall of Fame coach, a future Hall of Fame tight end, and possible future Hall of Fame wide receiver for several seasons in Tyreek Hill? I think everything about the situation for Patrick Mahomes in Kansas City is critical for us to understand. What he walked into, a situation where he didn't start or play in year one except for that week, week 17 game. So they drafted him and they had a plan. They were able to stick to it. Drafted him, you're going to sit behind Alex Smith for a year, and then you get a chance to play. The Bills drafted Josh Allen. He competed with Nathan Peterman and A.J. McCarron. A.J. McCarron didn't want anything to do with the competition. He gets cut. Nathan Peterman stinks out loud, but... You know, you're not ready to play Josh Allen, so you roll with Nathan Peterman. He lasts a half against the Ravens, and then you hand it over to Josh Allen. You were and never, ever able to stick to your plan. Now, part of that's your fault because you didn't have a reasonable quarterback in the room with Josh Allen. I totally recognize that, but let's start there. Let's then go to a veteran offensive line. Patrick Mahomes, that year one offensive line, Eric Fisher at left tackle, Andrew Wiley left guard, Mitch Morse at center. Laurent Duvernay Tardif at right guard and Mitchell Swartz at right tackle. You got a an above average starter in four out of five spots. You remember Josh Allen's offensive line to start his career? It was a disaster. So Andy Reid sticking to the plan. Alex Smith, a veteran offensive line. Oh, by the way, Travis Kelsey, the greatest tight end in the history of the NFL. Oh, by the way, Tyreek Hill is here. Kareem Hunt in his prime. And the defense. Josh Allen had nothing his first year. And I think that, you know, Josh Allen maybe needed to kind of go through some of that, work out the kinks, figure out what he can and cannot get away with. But I think Patrick Mahomes was able to do that behind closed doors. So, yeah, I think he's benefited tremendously. I think situation is critical for, for quarterbacks. And I'm not saying that Josh Allen didn't eventually get into a great, great situation, but it took a couple of years before the Bills kind of had the offensive line and the weapons right around him. And he's never had Travis Kelsey or Tyreek Hill. The next question is this line of questioning continues from Julius. How much has Josh Allen been hindered by not having offensive juggernauts like Andy Reid, Tyreek Hill, and Travis Kelsey? Meanwhile, having three different offensive coordinators in seven years. Although Diggs was clearly that dude in Buffalo, that's not nearly comparable to three potential Hall of Famers around you on offense. I know Mahomes has won two Super Bowls without Hill, which is very impressive. I think it's hard to quantify that. Josh Allen has been unbelievably productive and in some ways more productive than Patrick Mahomes. But it's pretty clear that Josh Allen, to me, has helped other players more than other players have helped him. Think about before they got to Buffalo and then what they wore in Buffalo, even Stephon Diggs. Stephon Diggs didn't touch the production he had in Buffalo 
in his, whatever, five, six seasons with the Vikings prior. John Brown, same deal. Cole Beasley has the best years of his career with Josh Allen. Isaiah McKenzie was nothing, right, and has been nothing since the, he left the Bills. And then the other guys have been rookies in a Devin Singletary or a James Cook or a Dawson Knox or a Dalton Kincaid or a Gabe Davis, right? It's very different. And even like kind of what I talked about with the gap between Sean McDermott and Andy Reid, even a guy like Stephon Diggs and what that gap is between a Stephon Diggs and a Travis Kelsey or a Stephon Diggs and a Tyree Kill. You're talking about elite players, but we're talking about a tier within the tier that you get from a Hill or a Kelsey. So yeah, it's hard to quantify it, but my prevailing thought from that question is, yeah, I think it's pretty clear that Josh Allen's helped the players that were brought in to help him more than they actually helped him. They helped, but it's undeniable that you have a pretty big sample size of guys that have played their best football with Josh Allen that was unlike any level that we've ever seen from them before or after. The last question here in this line of questioning from Julius is, do you believe if all things were the same, except player for player, would Mahomes have brought a Super Bowl to Buffalo by now? I want to say yes to this, but I'd be lying if I said I was totally confident because Josh Allen would be with Andy Reid and the Kansas City Chiefs, and I think they would be the the problem that they are with a different quarterback. Plus that defense, like you cannot you cannot overstate the importance of that defense. So I want to say yes, but I'm not totally confident because of the dynamics that would exist in Kansas City with Josh Allen and Andy Reid. And yes, look, the Bills should fire Sean McDermott and hire Andy Reid. Yes, I am for that idea. No questions asked. But unless you're going to hire like Harbaugh, J John Harbaugh, the Ravens Harbaugh, or Kyle Shanahan, or Andy Reid, I'm not sure, like, you see what I'm saying? You have a top 10 head coach. You got to truly be able to upgrade that if you're going to do it. So, yeah, if Andy Reid wants to come be the coach of the Bills and leave Kansas City, I think the Bills should definitely replace Sean McDermott. All right. We got so much more to get to in the last segment here, including that question I thought I was going to answer right here in this segment about the Bills and elite talent. I want to talk about this interior offensive line situation, how to get some edge help, and you know what the role is for Cole Bishop. A lot coming up on the other side of it, so be sure to stick with me. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open up the app and dream up bets anytime that I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. They got some fun fu football's futures bets on there, including some stuff for the Bills that I really like. Uh, Josh Allen, they have him at plus 800 to be the NFL MVP. They have Josh Allen at plus 130 to top 4,000 passing yards. That feels like some easy win right there. And then uh, the you can get Josh Allen over 27 and a half passing touchdowns in 2024 during the regular season at plus 104. So those are some of my favorite bets that you can check out for the Bills. Head on over to FanDuel.com and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. All right, the next question here comes from Mandy, who says, why do you think the Bills have continued to be a contender while only having three players in the top 100? Scheme, coaching, most of the other top teams have a lot more elite players. It's a great question from Mandy, and uh, the full NFL 100 is yet to come out, all right, from the players. But I can tell you that Kyle Krabs and I, we put together our top 100 players in the NFL last week for Locked On NFL Scouting. And we had three Bills players in there, Josh Allen, Matt Milano, and Deion Dawkins. And I'm not sure you can really make a case for there being another guy. Maybe Taron Johnson, he's probably knocking on the door pretty close. But for the most part, the Bills right now, based on what we know about players, not projecting growth, okay, but what you know about players, I think the Bills have three top 100 players in Josh Allen, Matt Milano, and Deion Dawkins. And so the question's fair. It's like, well, why are we talking about the Bills as a – contender when they don't have the volume of elite talent that other teams do. You know, some of the other better teams in the NFL have six, seven guys that might be in the top 100, five guys. The Bills only have three. At the same time, 
we, Kyle Krabs and I, have the Bills graded as the number five roster in football. And we we score it in a very particular way. Every position has value based on their importance. And then we go through and we put every player on the roster in a bucket that says franchise cornerstone, quality starter, sufficient starter, quality depth, et cetera, et cetera. And each one of those tiers has a point value associated with it. And we, if you're a, a franchise cornerstone, like elite player, like you get gassed up, you get like 25% more of the points than you do if you're just a quality starter. And the bill's still rated as the number five roster in the NFL. So why is that? I think it's, it speaks to the depth of the bills. There's no massive like issues. There's no slugs that are going to fill a key role for the bills. And so I, I think that's where it really leans into um, in, in the Batman and Robin conversation. Maybe the bills don't have a, you know, that many Batmans, but maybe the volume of Robins that they have equals a few Batmans. That's kind of the way that I look at it. And I think the, the reality is the next wave of impact players for the bills that would be in this top 100 conversation. They're all young and we're still finding out. Greg Rousseau, Christian Benford, Terrell Bernard, Ed Oliver, Spencer Brown, Khalil Shakir, James Cook, Dalton Kincaid, Osiris Torrance, right? Like young developing players that are knocking on the door. I mentioned Taron Johnson. Even some of the established players like a Rasul Douglas or a Daquan Jones are probably more in the top 100 to 150 than they are the top 100. And so I'd be curious if you extended these top 100 lists to top 150, I bet you the Bills fill up a good amount of that 150. So that's kind of the the thoughts that I have regarding this question. But I think it's fair to say that, yeah, compared to the other perceived contending teams, the Bills might not have, or not might not, they don't have the same volume of established elite players. But boy, oh boy, do they have quite a few knocking on the door. James says, how likely does Connor McGovern start at center with Edwards at left guard? Or do we actually see Cedric Van Pran Granger at center with McGovern back at left guard? I feel like this is huge for Josh Allen if we truly become the running team that Sean McDermott envisions. I've kind of checked around on this uh, because you know that I'm high on Cedric Van Pran Granger. And my expectation from those conversations is that I'm not expecting Cedric Van Pran Granger to start this year. Could that happen next year? Yeah, sure. But this year, I think you're fully in line with Connor McGovern at center, David Edwards at left guard. Like that's 100% the Bills' plan. So that's my expectation. Now, I do want to push back on something that James put in his question, and that's about uh, becoming the running team that Sean McDermott envisions. First of all, running the ball matters. It's important. You need to be able to run the ball. You need to be able to run the ball when you want to run the ball. Passing is still the most important thing. But even Sean, like Sean McDermott is asked about this, and he's like, guys, I, I mean, I came up under Andy Reid. Andy Reid, they've been criticizing Andy Reid for 30 years about running the ball and not running the ball frequently enough. There's no evidence that supports that Sean McDermott wants to be this running team. Does he want to run the ball more than what Brian Dayball had in mind? Yeah, that's true, and I think it should be true. But let's, let's get this out of our minds that – Sean McDermott wants the offense to be three yards in a cloud of dust and punt the ball all the time. There's, I mean, that's just not true. And we've seen that through three different offensive play cars. Has the rushing frequency ramped up? Yes. Should it have? Yeah. If you want to be a, a two-dimensional offense that's tough to defend, you better be able to run the football. Alex says, assuming this season is the last for Von Miller and assuming Bean wants to go out and pay big money for a premier edge rusher, who are some candidates that would be free agents or trade candidates that could fill that role for the Bills in 2025? Now we're talking, Alex. Let's go. Let's get us a big-time impact pass rusher. That's what I want. Um, In terms of free agency, that's going to be tough. Really, really good pass rushers are rarely available in free agency. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. Trey Hendrickson happened, right? He signed a free agent deal with the Cincinnati Bengals. But for the most part, these high-impact pass rushers don't hit the market. And so when you look at the upcoming free agents that are going to be edge rushers, it's like Josh Sweat, Baron Browning, Malcolm Kuntz, Josh Uche. That, those are the names that pop. I think if the Bills are going to want to add a big-time pass rush talent, 
I think they're going to have to do a Montez Sweat or Brian Burns type trade. Part with a second round pick. Get them from a team that either has a new regime, you know, which is pretty much the case in both Washington and, and Carolina is, is why those players are available. Or they don't necessarily want to pay the player and you can pluck them from them. I think that's what you're going to have to do. And maybe that's what you do with your extra second round pick next year. Then you obviously have to sign them to a massive contract. But I think it's more likely that the Bills would have to acquire this pass rusher through trade. And I think it's it's tough. It's tough for premier edge rush talent to fall to the back of the first round. It's very difficult. Even last year, when there was this group of pass rushers of Dallas Turner, Lee Tulatu, Jared Verse, and Chop Robinson, right? I, I wanted one of them at was the Bills pick 27 or 28, something like that. That's I my dream was to get one of those guys. Think about it like this. We had 14 offensive players in a row drafted, right? To start the draft. And even with that, all of those edge rushers were gone by pick 22, right? Chop Robinson was the last one picked by the Miami Dolphins. So, yeah, can you get a TJ Watt late in the first round? Sure, but it's, that's unlikely, right? I would love to see Brian. I, like This would be one of my top priorities for Brandon Bean, finding that game changer at pass rush. I think that's what this team needs more than anything in the world. Last one comes from Matt, who says, do you foresee Cole Bishop playing the last year's Taylor Rapp role this season, coming in as a third safety, all while learning the defense from the vets and coaches? The first question that I have here is, is that a role? Is there such thing as the Taylor Rapp role from last year? Was that more circumstantial because Matt Milano got hurt and you couldn't play long and late downs with Tyrell Dotson on the field, so you had to put Jordan Poyer at linebacker and bring Taylor Rapp in? Like, I think more likely than not, that's not really a role. More, The reality of it is that the Bills circumstantially had to do that. But I do think that what Cole Bishop proves to this team during training camp and preseason will define his role. If he's performing at a level where you think, man, we'd like to get him on the field, not sure he's a better option than Mike Edwards to be a 100% snap player, but it's worthwhile for us to consider him in sub packages, then yeah, I think Cole Bishop will determine that. But I think Bishop's a fascinating player. He's clearly part of the future of this defense, part of the future of the safety position. But what this year? Does he complement Taylor Rapp well enough? I think they're kind of similar players. Is he a better option than Mike Edwards? Maybe not. Unless he goes out there and performs at a high level. And where I'm a little bit confused on Cole Bishop is that we heard nothing, like literally nothing out of OTAs and mini camps regarding Cole Bishop. So he'll be a, a big time player that I'll have my eyes on next week when I'm at training camp practices. And I'll certainly be curious to see what's reported over the first few days and what opportunities he's getting and what is he doing with them. It's a big storyline. So there you have it, folks. Herd mentality in the books. The Bills players reporting for camp on Tuesday the 23rd. Practice begins on Wednesday the 24th. And we are full steam ahead covering the 2024 Bills. So don't miss anything. Make sure that you're subscribed. We'd love it if you took a second to rate, review, and share the podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Go Bills! And I look forward to catching up with you again real, real soon.